today we're gonna be reading from Malachi chapter two verses um seventeen through chapter three verses fifteen, page seven hundred and fifty four. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, How have we wearied him? By saying, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, Where is the God of justice? Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And then they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner, and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, How shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, and there may be food in my house, and therefore put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. And if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that I, it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Thank you. Y'all can take a seat. So, have you ever been in a situation where you realize pretty quickly that you have met your match? Remember talking with a friend of mine. Uh, he told me a story about how he and ten of his buddies. They decided to go uh, play paintball at one of these paintball courses, and there were 10 of them, and they, and they got to the course, and when they got there, they got there at the same time as 10 other guys, 10 strangers. They didn't know them, and so it was perfect, like, okay, well, yeah, this is great. Well, the, so they were able to stick together, their 10 buddies, against these other 10 guys, and, and, he, and my friend told me, you know, in retrospect, he's like, within a minute or two, we knew that we had met our match. And he said, he said, the whole thing was over so quickly. He's like, we never got one shot on any of them, and all of us just got drilled, and the whole thing was over. And uh, it, it, it turned out that these 10 guys that had showed up 
Uh, they weren't just 10 random guys. It was the, uh, the reigning national paintball championship team uh, that had just come to kind of have some fun. Have ever been in that situation where all of a sudden you realize that you have completely met your match? Uh, I had this happen to me a, n a number of years ago when I was living in Loveland, and I went to this young adult kind of gathering and got into a conversation with this guy, Rob Kazeski is his name, and we, uh, we hit it off, so we were talking, and, and somehow it came up that we both play tennis, and, and so I said, I said, Rob, what, let's go play tennis sometime. And there were a number of people that uh, were uh, kind of around us that, that knew Rob, and I could tell that they were all trying to not laugh. And it turns out that Rob is a professional tennis player. Uh, he was the number one uh, player in the state of Colorado his senior year in high school. And actually, he, for a living, he, he teaches tennis in Fort Collins. Uh, so initially, immediately, I knew I had met my match. You ever been in that situation where all of a sudden you realize that you have met your match? Today, we are finishing up our series on the Minor Prophets. Now, next week, we're going to start a brand new series, uh, a, a brand new series, uh, let's see here, am I looking, at, yeah, uh, a brand new series, oh, I thought I put, okay, yeah, no, we, we definitely are, okay, good, you got the slide, it's just not in my notes, okay, so we're, we're doing a brand new series starting uh, next, uh, next week, and the title of the series, as you can see, is, well, who is Jesus? That's what the question marks are. Who is Jesus and why it matters? Uh, you know, the reality is that in our day and age, what I have discovered is that, that most people uh, that you meet on the street, no matter what their background is, uh, no matter what religious affiliation, if they have any or whatever, most people have a, a favorable uh, view of Jesus. Uh, most people like Jesus. Uh, and, but the thing is, is that Everybody has a different view of who Jesus was. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be exploring this question of who is Jesus and why, why does it matter? And what we're going to discover is that your view of Jesus really has radically, uh, radical practical implications for the world and for your life. And so that's the question which we will be exploring for the next three months. And we're going to do this by going through the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, uh, these are three books that really are what sits at the center of them is this question of who is Jesus. So we're going to work our way through those books over the next three months up until the time uh, of Advent. Okay, so that's starting next week. But this week, we are finishing up our series on the Minor Prophets called Who You Call in Short. And, of course, this is a series about this collection of books, the final 12 books of the Old Testament. And as we have seen, these are books that are often overlooked for a number of reasons, one being they are the final books of the Old Testament, and many of us don't get that far in our reading of the Old Testament, but also because they are relatively short. But hopefully what you have seen throughout this series is that these minor prophets pack a major punch. And that is certainly the case when we come to the final one, uh, the final one in the Old Testament, the final uh, of the Minor Prophets, and indeed the last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. And I think that the message that emerges here right towards the end is really appropriate uh, for the end of this series and indeed for e really ending the Old Testament, right? How does the Old Testament end? And I would say that one of the central points that emerges as the Old Testament scriptures come to a close is this particular point about God, and here's what it is. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. Friends, when it comes to giving, when it comes to sacrifice, when you come before God, guess what? You have met your match. Like my friend and his group of friends who had met their match when they came before the national reigning championship paintball team, just like I had met my match when I came across my friend Rob Kazeski, the professional tennis player, on a much bigger, much grander scale, when it comes to giving, when you stand before, you have completely met your match. You cannot outgive God. This is what emerges here in verses 10 through 12, chapter 3. He says, God says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and 
pour down for you a blessing until there is no need. Some even say, uh, some translations say, throw out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. It's this idea that God will bless us. When we trust him, God will bless us, goes on here. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. All right, so, so he, he's saying, and he says, he says, test me in this. He's saying, look, come on, let's go a few rounds. Let's see what you got. Come on. Let me see you give. Come on, come, g- give me something, give. And let's just see if I give back even more. Come on. Try me. Test me. Let's go a few rounds. You can't outgive me. We see this here, uh, this phrase, test me. This is a rare instance in the Bible where God tells us to test him. But what we need to realize is, is that really what this is saying, when he says, test me in this, it's really another way of saying, trust me in this. To, to test God in this appropriate way, as we'll see, is really just trusting him. And if you think about it, Anytime you exercise trust in a person, there's a sense in which it's a test. I mean, you're not trying to make it a test. It just kind of is. So uh, let's imagine maybe you got a new boyfriend and uh, you really like him and, and uh, whatever. You're getting to know him. And, and whatever reason, you need to go to the airport. <coughs> and so you, uh, you call up your boyfriend and say, hey, can you, can you give me a ride to the airport? And, you know, and it's, it's an early one, you know, I, I can't afford flying at normal hours, so uh, I'm going to need you to pick me up at 2 in the morning. Uh, can you take me to the airport? Okay. Now, when you, when you ask somebody to take you to the airport, especially at 2 in the morning, you are exercising trust. Because we all know if you, you miss a flight, it's just a nightmare, right? It really is. And so you're, you are just in asking them to do that, you're, you're, you're you know, exercising trust. And so, of course, if, if your boyfriend does indeed show up at two, well, that you're going to, okay, good. I'm going to continue to trust. Now, if this Yahoo, whoever he happens to be, doesn't show up, and you, you ask him another time, he doesn't show up again, well, you're going to start to wonder. You see what I mean? Like, you, you're not necessarily trying to test them. You're just exercising trust. But in that act of trust, there is this sort of implicit test. Now, this is different, you see, from the kind of cynical lack of faith testing that the Bible does prohibit, right? So we've seen that kind of testing is really born out of faith. But there is a way of testing a person or or God that really comes out of a lack of faith. And I can give you an example of this. Uh, I, truthfully, I feel like I see this on Facebook all the time. This is a, this is a pet peeve of mine. kind of drives me nuts. And I think this is the kind of testing uh, that is the sort of cynical lack of faith testing that I think is prohibited in the Bible. Because the Bible says, do not test God, right? I, sh- I should say that when it says that in the book of Deuteronomy, it's a, for one thing, it's a different word than, a different Hebrew word than the word that is used here in Malachi. But it's also a different concept. The concept of this kind of testing that you shouldn't do is, again, this kind of testing that is born out of a lack of trust, lack of belief. And again, it's the kind of thing I feel like I see all the time on Facebook. And it's when you see this kind of post on Facebook that says, Let's see who my friends really are. And if they're really my friend, they'll repost this, and then I'll know who my friends are, right? You ever seen that? Like, that's just like, it's just like this, oh, my gosh, really? Like, like that's how you're going to know who your friends are, that they reposted something on Facebook? And it becomes this kind, and, and oftentimes they'll say, I'll bet nobody shares it. You seen that? I'll bet nobody posts it. Right, that, that's that kind of, really, it's a cynical lack of belief. And that's the kind of testing saying, you don't do that to God. You don't test God born out of something that, really, you're just testing him, and it's to show that, that you don't trust him. Right? So that, that's the difference. But, but to exercise faith, to step out in faith, that's the kind of testing that he is actually asking us to do. Okay, God says, test me. But what does this testing mean? look like? What is that? How does that manifest itself practically? Okay. The way you test God, ready for this, is by doing what he says. That's it. (laughs) It's that simple. The way you test God, the way you exercise trust in him, is by doing what he says, by obeying his commandments. This particular command that he gives here, he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. This is not just a sort of uh, random, uh, uh, request. 
this goes back to the law, the covenant that was made between the people of Israel and God. We see it as recorded in Deuteronomy. He's just pointing back to something they already, as a people, agreed to. We see this here in Deuteronomy chapter 12. Here he says, These are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go. And there, here it is, you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the contributions that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock. Now, uh, you see this, so th this is something that was commanded to them. Now, okay, so in, in that society, uh, it was an agricultural society and a shepherding society. So the way that they would give financially to God was they would give some of their crops or they would give some of their flock, right? So th things are different today. So I would appreciate if you do not put a lamb in the, the, the plate right there. I don't really think I would know what to do with that. Okay, but, th but that's how they did it. But the point is, is that, when, uh, when God says this to them, bring a tithe in the story, he's just, he's just pointing back to something that was already a part of their, of their uh, covenant with him. And, of course, uh, the, so the, the point here is that as we look to the times of Malachi, when he comes and says, bring the full tithe in the storehouse, well, what's going on here? Well, here's the whole point. They weren't keeping the covenant. In a lot of different ways, not just in terms of uh, finances. Again, this is just one of the ways in which we're called to trust him. And they weren't keeping it. And this is, of course, what emerges in verse 8. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? And he says, in your tithes and contributions. And of course, this points us back to really what the minor prophets are all about. If we think about the minor prophets what they saw as their kind of vocational calling is that they were the covenant enforcers. They were the ones that, that called the people of Israel back to the commitment that they as a people had made to the covenant. And this is the commitment that you made in your relationship with God and that when the prophets saw that they weren't obeying that, then they would try to call them back to it. In fact, actually, sometimes they would even uh, call God to account if it seemed like God wasn't doing it. We find that in the book of Habakkuk as well. But most of the time, they're calling the people of Israel back to you uh, commitment to the covenant. And what we discover is that the entire book of Malachi is really just about the ways in which they are not uh, heeding and obeying the covenant. It's, it's structured in the form of six disputations, the book of Malachi is, and each of these disputations are six disputes that God has with the people of Israel for ways in which they are not doing what he says. So, for example, another thing that emerges in Malachi is that it seems that some of the men have left their wives and have married some of the local women, local foreign women, and so Malachi calls them back to their vows. Like, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you breaking that? That's not just breaking your marriage vow, but in doing breaking the, you're breaking the commitment uh, that you made to God. Okay. The question, of course, is this. Why have they turned from God? Why have they decided to stop living in obedience to him? Why have they decided to stop doing what God says? And here's, here's the answer. It's pretty straightforward. They think doing, doing what God says is pointless. That's the conclusion that they have come to. Having lived their lives tried to follow God as they see it, they've come to the conclusion that it's pointless. And we see this, this emerges at the beginning and at the end of the passage that was read. It, it forms what's known as an inclusio, when you have sort of one thing that's stated at the beginning and then the same thing that's stated at the end, it sort of forms a unit of thought and then also helps to summarize what is central to what's going on in the passage. So we see this at the beginning and at the end. Verse 17 of chapter 2. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? 
That's chapter 2, verse 17, beginning of the passage, and then at the end of the passage as well, verses 14 and 15 from chapter 3. You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. I notice that they're saying, look, you're telling us to put you to the test, God? Well, guess what? Uh, wicked people, they put you to the test all the time. And they go against your word and they're like, look, he's not going to do anything. And they're right. You don't do anything. You see, they've come to the conclusion that being obedient to God is pointless. <clears throat> How many of us can relate to that? How many of us have perhaps sometimes come to that conclusion that there is no point in doing what God says because there is no benefit to it? Or put it another way, how many of us have done the right thing and suffered for it? Right, you've heard the saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Right? That, that's the conclusion we come to. How many of us have kind of faced that? You, you do the right thing. I mean, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a personal example from my own life. Uh, back in 2007, I bought a home. Now, if anybody knows anything about real estate, you know that the year 2007 might be the worst year in the history of civilization to buy a house. I, I buy that thing, and literally like the next day, boom, the market crashes. It loses, I don't know what it was, like 40% of its value, at least some, something ridiculous like that. And here's the truth. We were advised by people to do a short sale. And a lot of people did. I'm not judging if you did. No judgment here. Uh, a short sale and where you sell it back even though you're selling it for less than what you owe uh, because they were, the penalties weren't as strong for short sales in that season because so many people were in that position, right? So it, that was kind of like, seemed like the smart kind of thing to do from a financial standpoint. But we felt like the whole point of a short sale is that you sell it if you can't make the payments, the problem was we could make the payments, and we had made this commitment. So we felt like, and you can argue whether or not this is true or not. It's not really my point. But my point is we felt like, no, we, we, in integrity, we can't do this. We have got to keep making these payments. And honestly, it, it hurt us. I mean, with that, that word, you know, I still sometimes kind of get a little bitter. Right? You do the right thing. You do the right thing, and you suffer for it. Can anybody relate to that? How, how many of us, maybe you... You fessed up to something that you did at work or wherever that you could have gotten away with. You didn't have to say anything, but you did, and you suffered for it. Maybe you didn't get promoted, or maybe you even got fired. And you could have hidden it. You could have not said anything. And you decided to be obedient to what the Lord says, to be honest, to have integrity. And you, you suffered for it, right? How many of us, like, we, we, we come to this conclusion that, look, being kind it's like wearing a target on your back. Right? If you're, if you're kind, people, that, they just sniff you out, you know? I mean, you're, you're like a deer in hunting season. I mean, they just come for you if you're kind. You're, you're like a, you know, being a kind person is kind of like being a welcome mat at a garage sale. I mean, everybody's quick, easy, you know, same thing you can grab and just kind of walk all over it. How many of us come to this conclusion? Well, yeah, I, I, I don't follow what God says because honestly... It's pointless. Now, of course, what's interesting about this, and this emerges in this passage as well, is that this often does lead to a kind of hypocrisy uh, because what happens is, is uh, we, we still, we're still mad at God for the fact that he doesn't seem to do anything to those who do what's wrong. And so we cry out. This so cries out here in, in verse uh, 17b. Where is the God of justice, right? God, where are you? Why don't you do anything to those people who keep doing what's wrong? even though you gave up on doing what was right a long time ago. Now, you're still mad about other people doing it, but you're starting to do it yourself. But you're still mad at them, right? So it leads to this kind of hypocrisy. Okay, so what is Malachi doing here then in this environment? What is he saying to the people of Judah at this time and then, and then to us as well? And, and here's really what he, he wants us to see. He's reminding them and he's reminding us that our perspective is very skewed. That when we start to think this way, 
we are really not seeing things in reality. We have been fooled. You know, last week, yeah, last week we looked at uh, the book of Zechariah. And the Zechariah is basically apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature is a, a kind of literature that, that w- uses a lot of uh, imagery, a lot of imaginative imagery and metaphors. And, and, but the whole point of the imagery is that if you understand what it's saying, it's trying to show you the way things really are. Right? It's trying to, it's, uh, apocalyptic means to unveil, pull the veil back. So apocalyptic literature is, is a literature that is basically saying, look, people don't see things the way they really are. They're fooled. They've been deceived. And so here's the truth about God's world. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give you the way God sees things. And of course, trying to see things the way God sees things is a little bit hard for us to do. So they use a lot of imagery, a lot of metaphor to try to get at the point. But, but in the end, it's just trying to say, look, you need to have a totally different perspective. That's what Zechariah is largely about. And we see the same thing here in Malachi. And what he wants us to do is to get back to what he's saying is true. And here's what it is. And it's that you can't outgive God. He's saying you can't. You cannot be deceived by what you think is true and lose sight of this reality that you cannot I would give God. Friends, here's, here's the truth, okay? God wants to bless you beyond measure. God wants to bless you beyond anything that you can imagine. In fact, what we discover <laughs> is that that's why he created us. We were created by God in order for him to bless us. And we see this in a number of different places in the scriptures. One place in particular I often go back to is Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. This is a very key passage in the Old Testament scriptures. It really sets the tone for the entire narrative that then unfolds in the Old Testament and into the New. Let me read it for you here. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, notice here, this doesn't just talk about what God plans to do. He also shows us what our purpose is, right? You see your purpose as well. What, what is our purpose here? Our purpose on the earth is to bless others. Did you know that? Like that, that's ultimately, yes. A lot of us are like, what, what am I here for? I'll tell you very simply. You're here to bless others. Yes, God can give you a more specific calling in a particular situation. Uh, but, but oftentimes, we, we just lose sight of the fact, like, I don't know what my calling is. Well, you, if you don't know specifically, you do know in general what it is. It's to bless the people around you. Now, think about that. When, when you wake up, uh, kids that, that are in school, kids, maybe you're in college, I don't know. Wait, wait, you, you go to school, okay, and you meet your fellow students at school. What, what is your primary purpose that day in school? I'll tell you what it is. It's to bless the people around you. When you go to work, what is your number one goal? What is your number one priority? You know what it is? It's to bless people. When you wake up in the morning, the number one thing to think to yourself about your purpose is this. How can I make this day better for the people around me? You see that? It's really that simple. How can I make this day better for the people around me? around me, right? Okay, so that, that's really your purpose. It's that simple. It's simply to bless those around you. Now, we shouldn't be surprised by that. Why? Uh, because we were made by God in the image of God, and that's his purpose. God's purpose is to bless us. Uh, it, it flows completely out of his nature. His nature is to give. His nature is to love. And we see this in the book of First John. Here's a little trailer. This is a trailer for the upcoming series. And we see this here. This is 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not 
love does not know God because God is love. You see this? God's very nature is to love. And we're going to see this. All, you're, I'm going to be hitting this home for the next three months in the book of 1 John. This, this is his nature is to love, right? In other words, there, there's not like, it's not like God is, was just kind of like God, and then one day he decided, you know what, I think I'm going to be loving. Uh, we do this sometimes, right? You know, like, you know what, I'm going to be loving today. Like, he didn't like, he wasn't like not loving, and then he just decided to be loving one day. That simply is who he is and has been from the beginning. We see this actually in the book of John, which uh, the gospel of John, written by the same John uh, of the letters that we're going to be looking at coming up here. What he says here, as he records Jesus saying this, Jesus says this. Jesus says, Father, Heavenly Father, I desire that you also, whom you have given me, excuse me, I, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am. To see my glory that you have given me, and here it is, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Look at that. You see this? God the Father has been loving God the Son before anything was here. That love, that, that instinct to give has never not been a part of God. God the Father loving God the Son and God the Son reciprocating this. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, the, the great Puritan reformer, he's famous for talking about how the ultimate purpose of God is his own glory. So God seeks to, to give himself glory, and then we're to glorify him as well. But what Edwards goes on to say is he says, well, the reason why God desires to glorify himself is because of his selflessness. So what he wants to glorify is his selflessness because he doesn't want anything else to usurp the selflessness that flows out of him. So he's trying to glorify the fact that he is one who gives. You see, God, here's what, God wants to bless you, and this is not a tangential issue. This is not like one attribute of God. I'm talking about all the different attributes of God. Oh, you know, he's strong, he's powerful, he's mighty, he's holy, all that. Oh, and he likes to bless. No, listen, literally. Number one is he wants to bless you. That's it. That's fundamental. It's not, it's not even a side issue. This is fundamentally who God is. God wants to bless you. Okay, so here's what we need to see then. When it comes to the blessings of God, it is never a question of if, but only of when and how. That's it. It's never a matter of if, it's only a matter of when and a matter of how. Now, sometimes it's a matter of when. And we saw this, again, when we looked at the book of Habakkuk. And uh, Habakkuk was addressing a situation similar here where people of Israel are like, God, where are you? <laughs> where is your blessing, right? And we discovered that there's literally one word can sum up w the, the way the, the conversation between Habakkuk and God goes. God responds to all this with one word. He says this. Wait. That's it, wait. My blessing is coming, but you have to wait. Right? So, so, so sometimes God's blessing, it's not a matter of if, but it often is a matter of when. Secondly, it's also a matter of how. How is God going to bless us? And what we discover in this passage here in Malachi is that God's blessing can be financial and material. It absolutely can be. That's uh, what emerges here in verse 11 when he says, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not, de so it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. He says, I will rebuke the devourer. Many of you may remember from early on in our series when we looked at the book of Joel and the book of Joel addressed uh, the issue that was often a problem in Israel and as an agricultural society, and that was that locust plagues would come in and would devour their crops. And Joel deals with a, 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 a really big kind of plague that comes. But we see that that was not all that uncommon. These locusts would come in and would devour the crops. And so here, God's saying, I will drive out the locusts. I will drive out the devourer, right, so that you will have material and financial prosperity. So listen, oftentimes when God blesses us, he blesses us with financial and material 
a blessing, right? And so y- you can, y- you know, you can pray for that. I mean, I, you know, my wife and I, we, we pray for that. Uh, we are, you know, right now we're kind of casually in the housing market uh, looking for a house. We're a little nervous. Haven't had a good experience with that in the past. Uh, but hey, you know, we're praying that the Lord will bless us with that. We're praying that he will, he will drive out the devourer, right? Meaning the interest rates and other bidders, you know, whatever that might be. I don't know. He'll drive them out so that we can get around. So God often will bless us financially and materially. So you can pray for that, right? For sure. Okay. But that isn't always the way God blesses us. There are a myriad of other ways in which God blesses us. Sometimes God might bless you with your health. God might bless you with great friends. God might bless you with a great church community. There's a million ways in which God might bless you. In fact, I might suggest this. One of our biggest problems is that we don't notice when God blesses us. We often have a very narrow focus on what God's blessing would look like. And, and this is where, again, we need, we need the veil pulled off. We need to have a new perspective. And we need to realize that God's blessing can come in ways that maybe don't necessarily fit the narrow focus that you've put on that blessing. Let me put it a, a different way. I would suggest that literally right now, at this very moment, there is somebody in this world praying that God would bless them with something that you have, something you already have. In fact, I'll bet you there's a hundred different things right now, a hundred different people in this world, on this planet, are praying for right now that you already have. Right now, parents, parents, right now, somebody is praying that God would give them a child. Those of you uh, who are employed, guess what? Right now, somebody is praying that God would give them a job. Right now, somebody is praying that, that, it, 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 that for health. Right now, somebody is, is praying for a friend, just a friend. Somebody is praying for church community. Somebody is praying for a way to get from point A to point B. They're praying for a car. Like literally, a hundred things that you have. There's a hundred people right now praying for what you have. And if they receive it, they're going to praise the Lord because they're going to see it as a blessing from God. You see, I think our biggest problem is that we don't always notice the blessings that God gives us. Friends, God wants to bless you. God does bless you. And you can't outgive him. And so it's in this context then that Malachi challenges them and challenges us. And he says, give. Give back to God. Put that out there. Trust in him. You see, God loves to bless us, but guess, guess who he really likes to bless? God loves to bless those who trust him. When we put our trust in God, he loves to bless those who exercise faith. So I, I, I want to encourage you to think about that. I want you to think about what you give to God, what you give financially. I want you to think about what you give uh, in terms of your time. I want you to think about what you give in terms of your behavior. And do you live in accordance with the commands of God? Because when you do, then you are giving. You are stepping out in faith. And I want to encourage you to up your game in terms of giving as a way of testing him, as a way of exercising trust and trusting that when you do so, he will bless you, right? He's saying, look, he's saying, try me. Come on. Come on, give. Come on, let's go. Let's go a few rounds. Let's see what you got. You got a pretty, yeah, no, you got nothing. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you cannot outgive me. Turn with me if you're not already there. Go ahead. If you can grab a Bible, the one in front, uh, yeah. Would love for you to all turn to this, okay? I want you to turn in your Bible to page 754. Right? This is this this is no sword drills where I, you know, name the book and then it's a race to see who can find it. I'm just gonna tell you the page number, okay? Page 754 in these black pew Bibles. 
And what you're going to discover is that th this is the page from which the passage that was read comes. Malachi chapter 3. Uh, this is right at the end of the Old Testament, last book in the Old Testament. And so, like I said, I think it's pretty appropriate that in the last book of the Old Testament, we get this charge right at the end where God tells us to test him. He says, you can't outgive me, right? If you trust me, I will bless you beyond anything you can imagine. So the question becomes, well, gosh, I wonder, how is he going to bless us? How is he going to make good on this promise? Everybody on page 754? All right, just turn the page. One page. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see, in Malachi, God says he's going to throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out more blessing than we can imagine. And we're all thinking... Oh, boy, money, ka -ching, ching ching That's what we're all thinking, right? Oh, he has something so much bigger. God gives of himself. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It is in the nature of God to give. Look at this. God gives his son. And then what is the son's nature? Well, his, the son's like the father. The son gives his life. The father gives the son. The son gives his life. It's just give, 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 give. Friends, you cannot outgive God. You see this? He's willing to give of his own son. He's willing to give of his own life. This is a God you can trust. This is a God where you can step out in faith and give trusting that he will outgive you. We now come to our time of communion. What is communion all about? Well, communion is a reminder of the reality we've just looked at. Communion is a reminder of the depths to which God is willing to go and the lengths to which he's willing to go, the amount he is willing to give. The bread and the cup represent the body and the blood of Christ pointing us to the Son of God, the Son that was given by the Father, the Son who gave of himself because you can't outgive God. 